Hello everyone, this is Ola Ali. Uh, the topic for now is active transport. Remember before we discussed the passive transport and this can be in the form of just simple diffusion in which molecules move directly from the higher to the lower concentration through the cell membrane and it can be facilitated diffusion in which molecules also move from the higher to the lower concentration but the molecules are heavy so they need a carrier to guide them through the cell membrane also the passive transport can be in the form of osmosis which is water diffusion on the other hand, the active transport means movement of molecules from the lower concentration side to the higher concentration side. And here, energy must be utilized in the form of ATP. In passive transport, there is no energy required. The active transport can be primary or secondary active transport. Now let's go with the primary active transport. It happens through pumps and those pumps are able to utilize ATP. So they break down ATP to become adenosine diphosphate by breaking a phosphate. And by doing this, energy is utilized, helping molecules to go against their concentration gradient from the lower to the higher concentration. Let's discuss two examples of the primary active transport, calcium pump and sodium potassium pump. The goal of having calcium pump is to keep lower calcium concentration inside the cytoplasm of the cells. So calcium moves from the lower concentration here in the cell cytoplasm outside of the cell through the use of calcium pump that is able to obtain energy from ATP. Also, calcium goes from the lower concentration in the cell cytoplasm to be stored here in the cytoplasm, in the endoplasmic reticulum through the calcium pump. So there are two ways to keep low calcium level in the cytoplasm by moving outside of the cell from the lower to the higher concentration through calcium pump or moving inside the cell but stored in their storage place which is the endoplasmic reticulum. Sodium potassium pump is also a form of active transport. So if you look here in the cell, there is high concentration of sodium and lower concentration, there is sorry, high concentration of potassium and there is a lower concentration of sodium. What happens is Sodium moves against the concentration gradient from the lower concentration inside the cell to the higher concentration outside of the cell against its concentration gradient. And potassium moves from the lower concentration outside of the cell to the higher concentration inside by using ATP. Every time you use an ATP by the sodium potassium pump, three sodium move out of the cell and only two potassium move inside of the cell. As a result, because sodium and potassium both are positively charged, since we lose three positive charge out and only gain two, so the inside of the cell will have a negative charge that we call a resting membrane potential.
So the functions of the sodium potassium pump is to maintain the resting membrane potential that has a negative charge inside of the cell membrane and positive charge outside of the cell membrane. Also, sodium potassium pump, because it kicks sodium out of the cell, it maintains osmolarity. Remember that sodium is responsible for the blood osmolarity. And potassium is responsible for the intracellular osmolarity. Also, sodium and potassium pump provides energy that is needed for the secondary active transport. That's why we call it secondary, because it needs this primary step to happen, which is the primary active transport, sodium potassium pump. The secondary active transport, again, it needs sodium potassium pump to happen first. This can be in the form of co-transport in which sodium moves with another molecule in the same direction, like glucose co-transport, or it can be counter-transport, in which sodium moves to one direction and the other molecule moves to the other direction. Our example is sodium-calcium exchanger. So in case of co-transport, here our example is sodium and glucose co-transport. So if you look here, this is the intestinal cell. Here is the intestinal lumen. And here we have the food that we eat, including sodium and glucose. So the other side here is the blood. And if you look inside the cell, there is low sodium concentration and high potassium concentration. So what happens first is on this side of the cell membrane that we call basolateral membrane, sodium potassium pump happens. So sodium goes out and this results in lower sodium concentration inside of the intestinal cell. If you go to the other side of the, of the cell membrane, which is facing the lumen, the intestinal lumen, here we have sodium in our food. And sodium now goes to its concentration gradient, down to concentration gradient from the higher side to the lower side, taking glucose with. That's why we call it co-transport. Why sodium goes this way from the higher to the lower side? Why do we have lower side, lower concentration of sodium inside the cell? Because of sodium potassium pump that happens as a primary step. So this creates lower sodium concentration inside of the cell. So on the other side, sodium moves down the concentration gradient and it, ha it gets glucose going with. The counter-transport counter example here is sodium-calcium exchanger. So sodium-potassium pump must happen first, creating lower sodium concentration inside of the cell cytoplasm. So sodium can now move down to its concentration gradient from the higher concentration outside of the cell to the lower concentration inside. Remember that sodium has a positive charge, also calcium has a positive charge. So as sodium enters, calcium leaves, goes out of the cell. So there are two ways to keep a lower level of calcium in the cell cytoplasm. The first one is calcium pump, which is a primary active transport that kicks um, the, the calcium out of the cell through the use of ATP by calcium pump. The second way is sodium calcium exchanger, which is a secondary transport.
So here, this summarizes movement of molecules. So we have the passive transport through ion channels. Like here, this is just simple diffusion from the higher to the lower concentration site. And it can be facilitated diffusion, and it's also a passive process. No energy is needed, but here we need a carrier to facilitate movement of heavy molecules like glucose. It can be primary active transport like our calcium pump, sodium potassium pump, and hydrogen pump. Or it can be secondary active transport that needs the primary active transport to happen as a primary step, like um, sodium glucose co-transport, sodium amino acids, co-transport, sodium calcium exchanger, sodium hydrogen ion exchanger. Now, vesicular transport is also an active transport that needs energy in the form of ATP. We have endocytosis when molecules move inside of the cell. And exocytosis when molecules exit the cell. So here, in case of both, ATP is required. There is endocytosis that is receptor mediated. So the molecules must interact with certain receptors in the cell membrane to be able to enter the cell. Like cholesterol, cholesterol enters our cell through that receptor mediated endocytosis. There is something that we call pinocytosis when fluids enter the cell, like, for example, absorption of the fluid from the small intestine into the intestinal cells from the intestinal lumen. It is a form of pinocytosis. So it's cell drinking. Fluid enters the cells. Phagocytosis or cell eating happens in case of um, large particles that are eaten by the cell, like bacteria, for example. So this is a form of immune mechanism. 